Hello and welcome to a new episode here on the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. I'm your host, Niels Eichhorn, and today I am once more joined by my French colleague and partner in crime on this show, Andrew Hauck, from the beautiful central parts of France. And today we have a very special guest joining us from the States in Massachusetts, William Hartford. Uh, he is an independent scholar and has published pre previously Money, Morals, and Politics, Massachusetts in the Age of the Boston Associates, and Where's Our Responsibility? Unions and Economic Change in the New England Textile Industry, 1870 to 1960. But today we are going to go a little back in time with him, and we are going to look at an interesting partnership that he has just written about and published with the University of South Carolina Press which is Adams and Calhoun, From Shared Vision to Irreconcilable Conflict. So, Bill, thank you so much to, for joining us and also to your family for letting us have you on this Sunday and helping with all the technology. And so tell us a little bit about how did you come to write this dual intellectual biography of Adams and Calhoun. And we should probably say it's John Quincy Adams, not not any other of these the many branches of the Adams family. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I thought about that for a moment. I think it all goes back to a Friday afternoon at the UMass back, UMass bookstore in Amherst. I, I was uh looking for a you know something to read on a, for a button on a bus trip from uh Amherst, my home in West Springfield. And I picked up a book titled uh, The Life and Times of Congressman John Quincy Adams by Leonard Richards, one of my teachers. And I've been particularly interested in Adams ever since. He later made an appearance in, uh, you know, in an earlier book, my book, uh, a book I wrote, uh, A Social and Political History of Massachusetts from the late 18th century to the eve of the Civil War. But I wanted to do more. And, uh, but, I, but I didn't want to do a standard biography. There were too many out there already and they were very well done. And I didn't feel that I could add appreciably to what had already been written. So I cast casting around for a you know, way to go at it and, and lit on this notion of, of a dual biography. And Calhoun immediately came to mind. Oh. They'd, they'd been colleagues and very close colleagues and James Monroe's cabinet. And of course, you know, their subsequent breakup, you know, just opened up, opened up an examination of slavery abolition and the coming of the Civil War, the topics that I most wanted to address in the book. Hmm. So that's how we're getting it. Also at the same time, uh, you know, uh, uh, choice of uh, Calhoun was facilitated by the University of South Carolina Press which published 28 volumes of his, of his correspondence mm. and writings, mm. which made it very easy to assess the feasibility of the project and, of course, to proceed with the research once I decided to go this way. But yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how it began. As I, as I moved along, there, there are some challenges. The bit, biggest one concerned you know, coming up with a, with a workable structure. Mm. And... You know, I ultimately decided on a framework that's centered on four topic areas, nationalism and empire, uh, nullification and sectionalism, slavery and anti-slavery, and party politics in the expansion of slavery. Uh, I'd like to tell you that you know, I, you know, I had this sudden epiphany and it all came together really quickly. I'd be lying, of course. <laughs> <laughs> It actually took me much longer than it should have. Yeah, yeah. I considered any number of approaches that I've now mercifully forgotten. But, uh, uh, but once I once I did did come up with a framework, things really fell into line, uh, and many parts of the book just really wrote themselves. 
than where everything was going. So very quick question. How many of those volumes from the Calhoun papers did you buy? Uh, one. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, personally, they're all on the shelf of the UMass library. Perfect. Yeah. Sure you... What are they, $100 a piece? Is that... What? Well, are they about $100 a piece? They are now, I think, more than that, I believe. Yeah, I, I think they're over $100 now. At the time, I think they probably would have been about $100 a piece, yes. Hmm. Yeah. That's... Uh... That would have been a lot of money to spend for. 28, 28 volumes. That, that's an enormous amount of uh, of writing. Oh, it's yeah, yeah, yes. It, it, it's it's a, an extremely comprehensive uh, edition. The editors did a remarkable job. If they missed anything, they didn't miss much. Mm. In fact, they have a final volume that includes you know uh, correspondence from his early life, you know, earlier on that they missed the first time through, and they. Mm. Put it all together in a, you know, in a concluding volume. Wow. Do, do they include um, things like uh, speeches and newspaper articles about Calhoun? Yes, it does. Context? Y yes, it does. Yeah, it, it includes uh, all, all of his congressional speeches, all the speeches in the Senate, and quite quite a number of newspaper quite a number of newspaper articles. You know, uh, dealing with Calhoun mm -hmm. uh, that proved mm -hmm. extremely useful. Well, it's, it's a wonderful collection. That sounds uh, like an amazing, amazing tool, amazing resource. Oh, right. you know, it made you know made my life a lot easier, and yeah, you know, I'm sure I'm, I'm I'm not the first historian, you know, to yeah, you know, to thank you know the University of South Carolina for for, 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 for <laughs> so, so, what about Adams then? What about Quincy I'm Adams? Going to ask that too. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Niels. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, well, well, I mean, they're, they're they're just enormous resources, pretty accessible. If you have any access to a, a research library that uh, 609 uh, microfilm reels of the Adams family papers, not all of them, which of course you know deal with John Quincy Adams, but I mean, it's an incredible amount of paper, amount, amount of material. Uh, also. Uh, Twelve published volumes from his diary, but but at the same time, if you want to expand on that to recheck things, which I did from time to time, uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society has put the entire uh, put a man manuscript edition of the entire entire diaries online. So there's that. Wow. And we study so the wrong stuff, eh, Andrew. Jeez. So there, there's there was pl plenty to work with, and of course, you know, online today you can just find all types of supplementary material, to speeches and things of this sort. Yeah, it's almost I want to almost ask: Is it too much information to go through? N not really, uh, be because uh, although. You John Quincy was not perfectly consistent. There are a lot of consistencies in, you know, in his thought and conduct. So, no. Not really, no. So, <laughs> but I, I, but you know, I didn't. It's been a while since I've um, actually sat down in a, in a research library. Um, how, did you say microfiche or microfilm? Microfilm, yeah, reels, yeah. So, how many uh, individual images are on a a, a, a single reel? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to try. There are hundreds, that. hundreds, aren't there? Yeah, there there are hundreds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there are quite a number. Yeah. Because yeah, I remember going through the machine like with the reader and the four hundred or so. Uh, yeah. I, so six hundred yeah, ninety. Six hundred ninety. Six hundred nine. Six hundred nine. Yeah, reels of, of the Adams family papers, but that of course goes from John Adams on through to. The, to the children, you know, to yeah. uh, through, through Charles Francis Adams and his children, you know, Henry Charles Francis Jr. Okay, well, yeah. that's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, they were writers, that's for sure. Hmm. Yeah, they, you know, they uh, seems they, you know, they wrote with both hands. I, uh, they have a lot of interesting things to say. So they not only wrote a lot, but you know, they're they're always fun to read.
Yeah. You may not agree with them, and quite you know, I don't think anybody agrees fully with any of them. But yeah, I hope they're not. always interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and the style, yeah, and, and the style is always great too. I mean, oh yeah, they're always they're it's almost poetic what, what he writes. Uh, John Quincy had a wonderful writing style, but his father did as well. His father is kind of just oh. I don't know how to describe it. You know, kind of thump through his, you know, uh, his points, and uh, always fun to read. Mm -hmm. So, since we're on sources, I I did notice when you wrote the book, or in the in the book you write that Calhoun is a little bit tough to get to because of lack of sources for his early life. Yeah, yeah, very much. I I really had to just. Uh, everybody just tries to kind of tease it out, say his relationship with his father, things of this sort, and you're drawing a lot of inferences. Mm. Uh, I mean, John Quincy is really the exception here uh, in that I really can't offhand think of anyone, you know, whose early life is adolescence. This mm. is it's well documented as John Quincy's is. Mm. You have all these letters. It's, uh, you know, he started a diary very early on, and you just don't have these sources for most people. So, you know, very prominent people. I mean, who thinks so that they will be president one day, right? Yeah. <laughs> who has the intellectual rigor to and discipline to start writing? Sorry, let's see. There we go. <laughs> the problem with, with technology. Yeah, I lost the earphone. <laughs> so, You're good. Uh, you're good. Uh, We're back. <laughs> yeah. uh, your turn, Andrew. <laughs> um, so you talked about having to infer a lot about Calhoun's um, child, younger years, his, his early years. Um, it seems that Quincy Adams' writing is it, essentially, you know exactly what he's thinking. With Calhoun, you make it very clear that you don't know exactly what he's thinking. He's saying this, but he's actually meaning this. Uh, it's, uh, it's just, you just don't have a lot on what, he, what he's saying about anything mm. uh, before he gets to Congress. Oh, no, I, but I mean, this is uh, when, even when he's uh, a member of, of Monroe's cabinet, um, he's, he's uh, oh. publishing, th he, he's writing, uh, he's he has some of his ideas that he's, he's wearing prominently on, on his shirt sleeve, but otherwise you're having to infer things because yeah, he's not I, saying them directly. Yeah, uh, he's not nearly as introspective as Adams was. Who is Adams is constantly examining himself as an old New England trait. Uh, tell him not so much. And yeah, you know, so you, you, yeah, there, there, you, you know, you do have to infer more uh, as, as you know when dealing with Calhoun. He, I don't think he was ever, you know, intentionally duplicitous, but he just a lot that he just wasn't telling you. Hmm. Was it? Do you think it was because he didn't like comfortable talking about it, or because he just didn't think it was important? Yeah, that's uh. A tough one. Just, just how he was raised, you know. Adam, yeah. you know, Adams was, you know, instructed by his father to begin keep, keeping a diary at a very young age, mm -hmm. and I mean, you have these amazing things where he's he's coming back from England as an, an adolescent on a ship, and you know, he's doing these character sketches of of the captain of the ship, pointing out its shortcomings and you know, and its strengths, and you know, and he's just, where do you get this from? You know, fifteen year olds. <laughs> I hope mine are not. <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> and I don't hope they're listening to this to this moment right now that I said that about them. Yeah. That would be embarrassing. Um, but if you do listen to it, then please tell me that you'd listen to it. <laughs> um, so let's sort of kind of do big picture in part because I think one of the things for the listeners would be good to kind of think about, like. We have we have two two characters here with John Quincy Adams and John Calhoun, and what are sort of contact points that they have? 
sort of where where do they meet where do they interact with one another in their lifetime how much sort of the question like how well do they know each other uh not very well at all before entering the cabinet i they, they may have met somewhere but uh you have to remember that that adams spent much of the much of the pre many of the preceding years overseas mm -hmm. as ambassador to russia as an as an ambassador to great britain or emissary to great britain mm -hmm. uh so we really didn't I mean, he ran into somebody like you know Henry Clay, say you know at the Treaty of Gaunt, hmm. those negotiations. But no, he, he didn't see see Calhoun at all. But he was quickly impressed by Calhoun when he saw him within the cabinet. You know, he really felt that he was the strongest of his cabinet colleagues, and they worked reasonably closely together uh, hmm. over the course of roughly eight years. Uh, afterwards, uh, later later on. Uh, Calhoun continues to occupy this prominent, prominent place in Adams' political consciousness, mm. uh, largely because of the nullification controversy and its implications. Uh, so he's always thinking of Calhoun and what he called the Carolina Doctrine, uh, you know, uh, nullification, state interposition, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is much less so with Calhoun. Uh, Adams just make very intermittent appearances and his consciousness. So, you know, so I had a, a dealing with that was another challenge. How do I deal with that? Right. Well, focus on, on several, er several areas where they took diametric, diametrically opposed positions, very prominent positions. The gag, the gag rule controversy was one. Hmm. Uh, Adams, Adams was the, Leading, uh, leading, leading house house uh, house member opponent of the gag rule, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> at, uh, Calhoun uh, was a very strong position. Not only a very strong position against it, but an extreme position mm -hmm. that uh, with the support of his Carolina colleagues. And of course, you move on to Texas annexation or something like that. But you try to keep keep the uh, the narrative focused on on these topics where they they really are, uh, and they may not be speaking to each other or directly to each other, uh, but yeah. So Calhoun is a lot more in Adams's dreams than Adams is in Calhoun's dreams, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Oh, it's it, it is it a. Well, I guess on Adam's side, you you could say that he respects Calhoun, right? Yeah, he uh, Adams always found something, you know, some shortcoming in 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 nearly everybody he met, apart from his parents. I, 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 I'm glad. I, yeah. I, so I mean, yeah, a very fairly he uh, he, he he thought that Calhoun was much too susceptible to flattery. Hmm. And as he began to drift apart, he felt that Calhoun was overly duplicitous. Not the only person that Adams felt that about. Hmm. Yeah, Jefferson, for one. But uh, yeah, but he, but he, he never was did. Uh, he, he did. He, he always respect. Even when he, you know, even when he said, "I have that Calhoun's insanity begins with principles," which he develops in genius ways. I mean, it can be read as a kind of a very backhanded Adams like tribute, you know, to Calhoun's analytical prowess. And yeah, so he never <laughs> yeah, you have to understand Adams. <laughs> right. But yeah, he always had a certain respect for Calhoun. I think one of the reasons that, that he Calhoun continued to, to play uh, uh occupy such a large space in his political consciousness because of this respect. Yeah, you know, that he, Calhoun was somebody to be taken seriously. But to turn that around, who does Calhoun respect? <laughs> yeah, it's gee, I <laughs> well, it's... That's right. Adams from a very early point in life. And again, at his father's urging, was constantly assessing the people around him. As I said, yeah, pointing out yeah, their strengths and their weaknesses, and just. Just did this throughout his entire life. Uh, 
just something that you know that Calhoun never did. Uh, mm-hmm. fact, you know, he's often accused just uh, of being a little oblivious, you know, to the intentions of the people around him. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, susceptible to flattery, and uh, you know. Adams of could of course you know make this criticism because he received little flattery and didn't expect it. I suspect that you know the reason he didn't is because people didn't think it would do them any good to flatter him. Mm-hmm. And, or maybe worse, it might do the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> Something, yeah, I, yeah, mm-hmm. I might lead him to you know to suspect them. Yeah, you know, yeah, some right. some some ulterior motive or other. Yeah, it's so. Um, in in throughout the book, um, we talked about uh, we talked about this earlier. Um, you talk about their different their different worldviews. Um, Calhoun, much more of a pessimist, much more of an optimist. He than Quincy uh, Adams. He, he had bursts bursts of uh, of optimism from time to time, but they soon passed. And and he reverted to a more pessimistic stance. Adams, Adams is right, he's just filled with all, all sorts of gloomy pronouncements. Yet, overall, he was, he was fairly optimistic about things, where things were headed, on slavery particularly. Mm-hmm. We, yeah, this, this, was, this was the world of depression, you know, but, you know reasons as well but yeah God was on his side and uh hmm. so in the end he, he, he has he's so this basic optimism dig that out as I said the many the many gloomy uh observations you know you know that litter the pages of his diary hmm. um so when you talk about the time uh, in 1850, Quincy Adams has been dead for two years. Yes. John Calhoun dies in 1850, um, and you can we can take a step back and, and begin to assess how their their thoughts their thought process processes um, evolved into well, it w- would both you know end in. This irreconcilable conflict yeah. uh, that tore the nation apart. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Is, what I use, what I was really drawing drawing on uh, a book, Freedom National, by James Oakes. Very good book. Yeah, you know, and and I paired it up with with a, a slavery national standard that Calhoun elected. Toward, towards the end, towards the end of his life, and yeah, that and that was that became that became my way of tying it all together. Hmm. Adams, Adam, Adams is freedom national is one, you know, that bar slavery and territories, District of Columbia, bar slavery, use of slave labor in all military as installations. One that you know insisted that you know the Constitution, you know. In no way sanctioned, at, at no point sanctioned, you know, slavery in man, a property in man, and things of this sort. Calhoun, Calhoun at the end ties it all together, you know, re- rejects any kind of encroachment on Southern rights and erecting his own slavery national standard, which in the end comes to focus on what, he, what became a common property doctrine. Uh, you know, he realized he realized by the late 1840s that some of this nullification, state interposition, just didn't cut, you know, didn't cut any cheese, and you know, and territorial debates, if South Carolina, you know, if say Congress, uh, you know, uh, say passed a measure, from, you know, permitting California and New Mexico to ban slavery, it wouldn't matter if South Carolina rejected the measure, it's just you know, it's just irrelevant. So he came up with a common property doctrine. Mm-hmm. Which he argued that in territories with, with, with common property of the states. And 
as as consequence as a consequence, you know, Congress had had no authority, no right whatsoever to be on to be on slavery in them. Yeah, so it was so that was the way to kind of bring it all together at the end. Again, this freedom national, you know, slavery national, you know, dualism, and uh, what we have, mean, you know, oh. Sorry, no, I, I just no. wanted to, the, um, the way you end the book, um, talking about, um, sorry, spoiler, for those of you who, <laughs> yeah, too bad. <laughs> you, uh, you, you talk about emancipation as one of the uh, union's goals, um, one of the United States, Lincoln administration goals for, for the Civil War, um, drawn largely on Adams's thought. And how you yeah. bring it in, and you tie it into uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Tie it into what? To the, to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I was, you know, I just really. Adams, Adams was this kind of, uh, you know, he'd written all kinds of very middly uh, poetry throughout his career, throughout his throughout his long life. You know, I just felt that he, you know that yeah that he really would would have you know viewed what uh, Julia Ward Howe had to say about him and felt any kind of appreciable envy. You know that again that, uh, in in so in several respects, uh, one yeah, as he, as Paul as he would have been, you know, by the you know, slaughter taking place in Civil War battlefields. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't been surprised. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, the religious overtones would, I think, would have, would have, would have appealed to him. You know, he uh, came out of a culture, you know, this Puritan culture that, that expected, you know, uh, regular visitations, of God's anger on sinful people. He's sleeping. firmly believe that slavery was a sin. So yeah, so, when, you know, and how it talked about you know, traveling out the vintage of the grapes of wrath, you know, where the grapes of wrath are stored, you know, this is similarly uh I think you would have been quite struck by you know Roger, yeah, you know, that you know, as as God died to make men, you know, make men holy, let us die to make men free. So very much in keeping. I don't know to what degree, you know, religion or religious considerations, you know, influence any specific, you know, thing that he did. But religion was always there uh, with Adams. He began each day reading several, several verses, several chapters from the Bible. He worked his way through the Bible every year of his adult life. And it was just, it was always there in his life. And, he, you know, and how religious illusions were uh, in Appear everywhere, yeah, you know, you know, speeches, you know, his writings. So yeah, that that was the turn to you know why I turned to how why I was so struck by you know, hmm. why I felt that he, he would he would have been so taken by what she had to say. Well, it, it ends on a very strong note because of that because it it, it brings it um it brings the whole um the whole debate kind of to a to a, a just conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. Once, once I completed that, you know, that paragraph, I said, you know, I really don't have anything more to say. And yeah, that was a nice way, <laughs> nice, nice place there to you stop. Go. <laughs> My yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just got a lesson on how to write your conclusion, Andrew. There you go. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, hopefully, I can find something as strong as that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can always find an Adams. <laughs> yeah. um, I kind of was wondering too, because you you have a lot with regard to Calhoun and sort of his political political ideology of how he frames and how he sings of the United States, right? That sort of concurrent majority idea. Do we have anything kind of similar with Adams? How does he envision the United States? Is it like 
is it like the United States that his dad created with regard to like the United States of like the 1780s or is it like does his views of what the United States should be like how the republic should function does that change during his lifetime for him not appreciably uh he, you know he in terms of what the country should be found much in the declaration of independence mm -hmm. and and in his own reading of the constitution as I, as I said, he created this kind of constitutional counter narrative uh, that was very, if you read through, he's, he's, he's very clearly, I, or I believe anyway, it's very clearly responding to Calhoun and the Carolina Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And what, what are the principles here? Well, one is protection. He says all sound governments based on protection. A government that doesn't protect its citizens has no claim to their obedience. Yeah. Uh, one one element also, you know, uh, states' rights advocates' rejection of, you know, or narrow, extremely narrow reading of the general welfare clause. You know, he's, listen, you know, a government that doesn't promote the general welfare, it's not a government at all. Mm -hmm. So, so that yeah. is section section or section eight of Article One of the Constitution that, that I, yes, I, I, noted, yes, yeah. I I made a note of it. Um, yeah. Because it comes back uh, essentially throughout the entire book. Yeah, yeah, as, it, yeah. The powers of Congress in 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 Article One, Section Eight. Yeah, very expansive uh, interpretation of them. But so the General Welfare Clause, particularly, because it appears also in the preamble to the Constitution as well as Article One, Section Eight, uh, that you know one of the purposes of government is to promote the general welfare. But yeah, and so I, as much as I, I yeah, you know, so his 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 views on you know what the government should be it's a, a pure best in this constitutional counter narrative that he erected hmm. that he sketched out in response you know to Calhoun and the Carolina doctor. Yeah, <laughs> I I also kind of. How frames us. I, I kind of like the gag rule material because it's sort of it's it's this very interesting kind of it's it's like this cat and mouse game between like Calhoun in the Senate, John Quincy Adams in the in the House, and like how do you overcome this anti anti abolitionism, right? Like this problem here, and in that moment, Adams is very very much embracing the constitution with regard to the first amendment but also sort of ignoring the rules of congress to be like no you're not going to silence me i'm going to bring these petitions forward regardless it, it it's like yeah. it's really like i guess a bit arrogant but also like very solid embrace of freedom of expression here yeah uh well, that you know that you know that you know, and upholding the First Amendment protections that yeah that take a few liberties that's fine. <laughs> Just he's you know he saw no problem with that. Hmm. And yeah, I, I don't think he saw it as any kind of contradiction at all. Beautiful and distant might look a little different. <laughs> One thing um, that struck me is um, when talking about Calhoun, uh, essentially uh, before the before the gag rule, um, the less you talk about slavery, the better. Yes, that, that's 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 how the South felt generally. This is this is a carryover from from the Missouri controversy of the early eighteen twenties, where intersectional tensions, you know, over slavery, you know, went from zero to sixty overnight. This it's, this really scared the hell out of a lot of moderates. And they didn't forget that. So, yeah, let's not talk about slavery. And very much and among Southern leaders generally, you know, into, into the early 30s. In fact, the gag rule controversy kind of marks, marks a place where Calhoun, and, at any rate, the South Carolinians really depart from this. Because even even during the nullification controversy, he tried not to mention slavery. 
or not slavery per se. I mean, he was always talking about the producers of, you know, the major producers, uh, the producers of major staple crops rather than slave owners. Never mentioned slaves. You know, they were always, it was, or slavery was our peculiar institution. And he tried to keep things there. But yeah, he breaks free from that. Uh, in part, I, I think it's because he, he saw the gag rule controversy the, and the, the rise of, rise and spread of abolitionism at that time as both a threat and an opportunity. It was something that, it was something, I mean, something that did scare him, or at least the, probably less so the Garrisonians, you know, who angered him. But uh, people like the Tappans in New York, who tied into this evangelical network had these had these incredible organizational resources really scared them. It scared the South Carolinians generally. So there was there. So he, so you know he saw it as this, this this terrible threat, but he also saw it as an opportunity. I think one of his great disappointments, you know, in the wake of the nullification controversy, that more wasn't done. You know, to forge a united South. So. so by turning you know, anti-abolitionism here, you know, this is this is a way to renew that campaign. So, you know, um, I was, you know, at the time, you know, abolitionism becomes, you know, a threat that threat that can't be ignored. But at the same time, you know, an opportunity that can't be resisted, mm -hmm. and it's because. Uh, People like you know Henry Pinckney, uh, Charleston congressman, were telling you know, or, you know, or saying at the time, listen, you know, take, taking this hard line on the petition is going to result badly for us. It's, it's going to turn out very badly for the South. Yeah, we're going to be, it's going it's going to enable uh, you know, northern anti-slavery forces to assume the constitutional high ground. We don't want them to do that. We want to be thinking of ways that we can broaden, you know, our national support rather than ways, you know, detract, you know, taking steps that will detract it. Well, you talk about the um, in in, the, in that same context. You talk about the um, the United Kingdom uh, abolishing slavery in the West Indies, um, and uh, abolitionism becoming um, kind of an international. Moral high ground. As yeah, well. yeah, I, uh, yeah. There's, you know, there's this awareness that, uh, yeah, that uh, moral force of, of, of world, you know, seems to be against against slavery, and yeah, that's certainly one of, you know, very very much in government's mind at, at, at the time, and that of many southern leaders. Yeah. Well, actually, going to pick up from what. Where Andrew just took us the international side for a minute, <laughs> because I also was thinking in terms of like the this like the gag rule obviously is a very big point where Adams and Calhoun clash, but I also was thinking like the we have the Armistead case right with the um, the the slaves that rebel on the the Armistead and then end up in New York and or in, in yeah no in Connecticut right and they have to kind of negotiate through it. John Quincy Adams is the guy that actually argues the case in, in the Supreme Court. How did how did Calhoun react to that? Did that in any way kind of... I, I don't know how he reacted specifically, but I think, you know, that we can assume that he did not re react well to it. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, I, again, our, you know, our, again, uh, Adams', is, Adams is insistence or is his support for you know initiatives you have to prevent, mm -hmm. prevent the United States from intervening in slave escapes, you know, escapes by slave rebels or you know, or mm -hmm. intervening with the work of you know of British trips, uh, mm -hmm. British ships patrolling, you know, the, the African coast, you know, to you know, <clears throat> prevent, prevent slave voyages. So, yeah, all of this comes out of, out of his, you know, Amistad. That this is this is great, where where he where he make, he makes he makes the case that you know, the Constitution, you know, at no point sanctions property of man. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, 
it, actually, how much is that like? Um, you can go next, there, <laughs> Andrew. No, how, no, no, that, no. how much is that kind of part? Because you, I want to eventually get to the Cherokee briefly too. But and I, I love how we do in reverse chronology here. By the way, I, yeah. I kind of, I, I kind of wondered because with the Cherokee, you kind of indicate that a lot of, of Adams's sympathy is because he has a compassion for the for the Cherokee people. How much is it also that he has a very kind of personal compassion for for Africans or enslaved people? Um, how much is that sort of a personal trait on his part to kind of sympathize with people suffering, um, oppression, um, enslavement, kind of like being in a bad spot? Uh, that's fair, I say, yeah. Uh... He just didn't feel that people should be oppressed. I, you know, it's, uh, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how much further, further to go with that. Uh, I just, with African Americans, you know, he, I think it just deepened over the years, uh, you know, you know, his compassion. Prior to his going to Congress, he didn't, didn't come in contact with, with a, a lot of ordinary people, be the uh, white or African Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he starts to open up a bit, you know, in these years. You know, you see him, you know, attend, you know when he when he attended uh, black conventions, black Congress, uh, African American meetings, in a trip that in one Western trip that he did, I think he did it as much because. He, he was an endlessly curious person, and he really knew very little about these people. As, much, and that, and as and so, as much an effort to save his curiosity, you know, as to mm. work out his compassion. One of you know, it's one of his you know the most positive traits. Again, was this, he, he was learning throughout. You know, he never, you know, and in the seventies, he's, he's still he had much to learn. He just this endless curiosity. I mean, he's a person. He is, he is yeah, incredibly, incredibly erudite person. Uh, you know, he's written books on, on, you know, a couple volumes on, 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 on oratory. You know, at, you know, and during the time when he's been the Boston professor of oratory at Harvard, he wrote another one on weights and measures, very well received. He's just, Yeah, I drifted off the yeah. drifted off course a bit here. No, oh, right. curiosity does tend to lead to people having more sympathy for others. So, well, but Adam, so my, yeah, sorry, Adam. My, my 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 question actually uh, is kind of parallel to to yours, Niels. Um, it, how do you think uh, his time spent, his many many years spent abroad, uh, informed? His compassion or his his view of oppressed people. Uh, was he? Go ahead. Sorry. Oh no! You can find instances of this. You know, as a youth traveling through Poland and Russia, you know, he was appalled at feudal, feudal, you know, European feudalism. And so, yeah, there you you, you get. Points here, yeah, where you can see where yeah, ideas started to take take shape. But it's it's hard to say, you know. Uh, the only thing that really comes out of all this, you know, is his animus towards landed elites. It just it's just a life, yeah. You know, uh, used to drive him crazy when when people, you know, drove down merchants, you know, and, and prayed. Uh, the end of the lease is, is the best part of the population. He, I mean, he had his own, he had, he had his own grave reservations about working to ethics and conduct, but yeah, you know, it's just they were key, key people in the society, played important roles, you know, to have them, you know, just routinely you know, subordinated to the end of the lease, really annoyed, you know. Whether it was Jefferson, Jefferson's observations and his notes on Virginia, but you know, superiority, yeah, you 
aren't that Jackson Jackson's uh, assertions that you know, cultivators in the soil are the best part of the population. And it's just some, something that worked on him throughout his whole life. I mean, he, he, I, I was amazed by you know, the number of times he referred back to Jackson's speech, his 1832 speech in later years. Just, yeah, where did all this begin? <laughs> oh. uh, uh, flip side of the coin to that question that you just asked, Andrew. How about Calhoun? How much does he leave the country? How much does he kind of like show curiosity? How much does he show like like an inquisitive nature, or is he very like like stubbornly like narrow minded? In in did, did he ever go abroad? Yeah, well, that's the first no, question. No, right? he, no, I mean, you know, he, he had a you know, lay person's knowledge of what was what was you know going on in Europe. It was not something he ever drilled down deep on it. Or something he cared deeply about. Mm. And uh, yeah, he, he his, his his learning is it's just it's just much less eclectic than that of Adams. What what Adams knew, I mean, what Calhoun knew, he knew very well. Mm. What he just what his, 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 just 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 wasn't as broad. His interests just weren't as broad as that mm. as that of Adams. Sounds like the positive. sounds like the typical southerner, right? Like the little little wor the little circle around them that they know really well, and then well, the world well, uh, ends. Yeah, I, I, with, with I, the trip to New Haven, of course. Yeah, I, yeah, that. But yeah, I, I, I little little worried about the typ typical southerner. Charleston at that time was a an intellectually really intellectually vibrant place. People uh, very well learned in the social sciences, literature, mm. you know, physical sciences. You know, as I, I as you know, as I observed, I, I think Adams, you know, would have been would, would have been much more comfortable there had it not been for slavery than Calhoun Calhoun ever was, because he was never entirely comfortable in Charleston. Whenever he returned to California, I mean to South Carolina, you know, he went right to Port Hill, his plantation in the Carolina out country. Mm. It's interesting. Sort of he's so, he's not so the intellectual type. Yeah. Not really, no, but I can uh what he cared about, he, he read into. It. And uh yeah, you know, and, and you know, and this this comes out, I think, in a lot of his speeches. You can tell that he, he's he's done his work. Mm -hmm. said, what he knows, he knows well. Yeah. It, it's sort of an irony, right? When you think of like we, if he isn't isn't that curious minded, he's not the kind of as well and roundly read as Adams. But when it comes down to it, today we remember Calhoun and some of Calhoun's writing a lot more than we remember John Quincy Adams's writings. Yeah, uh, yeah, very much. Uh... Adams never, 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 never considered himself. Uh, I mean, he never really considered himself an intellectual, or you know, or, he, 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 uh, he had concerns about his own, about his creative powers. He had, he had incredible his knowledge, his his knowledge of his learning was just incredible. His, his son Charles Francis, who was certainly no slouch, was just amazed. You know, and, and how he could speak intelligibly, you know, knowledgeably, but an incredible range of subjects. Hmm. But he, uh, when he comments on the arts from time to time, John Quincy, you know, he's just, you know, he's just, he's just, I could never do that. I could never produce good art. Hmm. I just, I'm just not a creative sort. And yeah, you know, he wasn't much of a theoretician. I didn't pretend to be. I do like that you called John Charles Francis a slout. It's, it's, oh, he, he was not. He was. <laughs> he, he was no slouch in intellectual matters. You know, just, yeah. As a young as, as a young lawyer, he, he he felt that he his day was much better spent reading classics and working on a case. You know, some case or another 
So yeah, you <laughs> I'll need to put that in the book one day. <laughs> really? um, did did Kel, uh, I know that uh, Quincy Adams spoke many languages and he was very proficient at uh, French and Dutch and German, I believe. German, yes. Yes, because he, he, he'd, uh, he'd been the U.S. emissary to Prussia. That's right, okay. Yes. Um, what about Calhoun? <laughs> I, yeah, just English, I believe. I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think he, uh, he, he that he had fluency in any other language. There's no evidence of it, anyways. Yeah, it, it, it's such a weird contrast between the two because, on the one hand, John Quincy is very intellectual. You're talking, you, like you've said, um, very good at at language and good at good languages, good at math, good at all these, all these just vast. This scope of, of specialties cool. um yet at the same time in terms of theory constitutional theory especially he's much less yeah. proficient than than calhoun mm. yeah one of the great strengths of john quincy's constitutionalism was that he was often pushing him an open door and it's very conventional mm. he's not saying he's not saying anything <laughs> He's not challenging people. Calhoun is, you know, um, he always had a much tougher time with it, making his case. Yeah. yeah. But as, as I said, you know, in terms of, you know, creativity, yeah, you just, just find places from time to time where, you know, John Cook just very envious of people, you know, who, who really had, had great creative powers because he didn't feel what he did. Well, I guess we all have our strengths in that. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to, we're almost at the start of the book slowly. <laughs> right. Working uh, our way back. <laughs> yeah, we worked our way back through it. <laughs> so that's a first, actually. I don't think I've a ton of book backwards <laughs> before. Um, but I, I kind of was. I want to go to the Monroe. I want to start with the Monroe cabinet. My 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 question here, because Calhoun and Adams are in Monroe's cabinet. How is their working relation? Like, would you like? Would you say they're like good partners, and that they kind of challenge each other to kind of do better, or would you say they're kind of just respectful? Like, how how would you call? How would you respectful? Respectful, but they they perform kind of complementary roles. Adams, in effect, after the, you know, after this kind of Mr. Outside, you know, uh, trying, you know, <clears throat> seeking, you know, to obtain, you know, to expand the national domain, you know, obtain mm -hmm. new lands. And, to, you know, and to prevent further European colonization of, of the Americas. And Calhoun, on the other hand, that's just kind of Mr. Inside, you know, uh, trying to strengthen the military. Mm -hmm. uh, remove obstacles, you know, to the settlement of the West, which is to say Native Americans, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, and to and to promote the construction, you know, of a vast system of roads, bridges, you know, other internal improvements that would tie tie the tie tie the various regions together in national economy. So you said so they play complementary roles as nationalists, and I. Uh, Adams very much appreciated you know, mm -hmm. what Calhoun was doing in this regard. Though, of course, you know, they, they had differences on the Native American question. And I, I guess that's sort of the, the the play that you're doing was empire and nationalism, right? That Adams yeah. is more focused on the empire aspect, like abroad, whereas Calhoun is more thinking about the, the kind of tying the nation together and moving the slavery question west. Yeah, and, and yes, in part, yeah. Uh, though they were they were they they, they were both both interested in empire and nationalism, you know. Mm -hmm. Though though you're right. I mean it's it's a it's a nice distinction that, that you draw there, yeah. So how would go ahead, Andrew? No, just to, to to jump on that very quickly, uh, with you know Adams's uh, worldview looking at the United States from from 
from a kind of a, a international perspective, mm -hmm. whereas Calhoun's looking at it from the inside, like you were saying, uh, pushing westward, pushing the expand expanding the borders, um, and yeah, the very complementary relationship between the two. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, and, and say for that reason they work. They work. They work quite well together. Ah, uh, and he he just he just felt Adam just felt that Calhoun was destroying his you know apart from himself was destroying his member of the cabinet. <laughs> you know, like, We'll have to get like in a little bit to the question of like when the break really takes place between the two. But uh, before we get there, how I'm kind of like thinking here in the old early Republican notion, right? We have sort of the vision for the nation, nationalism, if you like, that um, Thomas Jefferson has, and then the counterpole, Alexander Hamilton's vision for the United States. If we kind of had to boil it down to like it's two sentences or so, how would what would be Adams and Calhoun's vision for the country? What what would they want the country to be like? What's their what would their nationalism entail? Yeah, uh, expansion, expansion, expansion into you know unsettled, unclean parts. You know, of the continental, what would become the continental United States and development. Mm -hmm. uh, development of places that have been settled. Mm -hmm. That's, that's re really where, where it's set young. Yeah. It's, it's a country moving westward and they want it to do so in a very developed, developed, very developed manner. Mm. That's yeah. But then that's also where the two of them are going to uh break apart yes yeah uh well this this begins to occur during you know during adams's presidency calhoun was his vice president yeah. uh <clears throat> calhoun's you know or adams suspected him probably probably quite probably quite rightly you know kind of bad mouthing him behind his back he, he also, you know, there are also uh, incidents, uh, you know, anyway, you know uh, in, in, in the Senate with Calhoun, of course, president of the Senate as vice president, where he just let John Randolph just uh, ramble on interminably, you know, his invective filled uh, denunciations of, you know, Adams and Clay and things of this sort. Yeah, so it's starting to come apart here, but it, it, it comes apart altogether, of course, during the nullification crisis. Hmm. No. Uh, Adam, you know, uh, let's go back to Adams' assigning a tariff of abominations. It was a tariff that, that raised duties considerably in a, in a broad range, broad range of commodities. Hmm. And uh, part of a strategy that had gone wrong on the part of Southern legislators, they felt that by, you know, by taking this bill that it focused on, Small range, you know, narrow range commodities, you know, adding, you know, lots more to it that, you know, they would kill the bill. Nobody, you know, everybody, you know, we can't take all this. Well, surprised they did. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is the background for the nullification, <clears throat> nullification controversy. Uh, here, part of the background, you know, there needs some South Carolina background as well. South Carolina came out of the panic of 1819. And in very bad shape, it was very slow to recover. You know, plummeting, you know, uh, declining cotton prices. Really, really, really. Or planters, Carolina planters, really took a hit from declining prices. So they didn't have large expanses of fresh land. You know, they could increase the crop. Also, the state suffered from you know, bad, badly managed credit system. You know, shortage. Circulating currency. It was it was really staggering through this period, and so what we see is a state that was kind of open. Yeah, certain mild forms of protectionism and uh, yeah, internal improvements. You know, at, at the beginning of the decade, it's just a dead set against them. Afterwards, as Calhoun makes this shift, it wasn't an easy one for him. I mean, Gallon was not the sort of person who flipped on a dime, you know, simply because of, you know, 
political considerations, he really had to convince himself that, you know, that, you know, that to, to make this move, to, you know, to become a leading states' rights advocate, and you can see it in some, you know, he, a number of statements, you know, in his, in his correspondence in those years, that he's a, a, a remarkably equivocal, you know, and that's just not how Calvin spoke or thought. You know, Apparently, you know, if he could say something clearly and you know, to the point, he didn't say it. But here he's fumbling around before he, before he arrives at what would become, you know, the doctrine of nullification or state interposition. This, you know, and this view that states could nullify, you know, any law that, you know, they both they deemed unconstitutional. Or, this is where this is where the break, you know, the break between yeah, you know, Calhoun and Adams becomes uh really widens. We have this this short brief exchange of letters in the early in the, in the early 1830s where you know Calhoun reached out, out to Ke Adams. You know, and uh you know, I, and he, you know, he, he, he appended an, an address, that, you know, the Fort Hill address, which is lined up, restated his, his position of nullification. Adams replied, you know, Adams replied, you know, pleasantly enough, but he also included, you know, uh, you know uh, a recent speech, you know, which, which he decried the, you know, the, you know, the lunacy of, of nullification. So, yeah, it's by then, it, yeah, it was over. Mm. And, yeah, they... and I, I actually, before I give it back to Andrew for some last questions, there was one thing that really, that really struck me um, when you talked about Calhoun and the War of 1812, and that was that one of the lessons that Calhoun worked away with from the War of 1812 yeah. was the need for industrial development. Right. Yeah. If you think of Southerners, you don't think industrial development usually. You think agriculture, plantations, slavery, but not industrial development. Here's Calhoun seeing exactly what the South needs to do to be get infrastructure. Yeah, get infrastructure, right? Build yeah, industry, yeah. produce yeah. cotton mills and everything. And it's like it, it seems like he was briefly there on the right track for the future of the South. <laughs> And and part throughout his whole life, Calhoun was never at any point a backward-looking agrarian. You know, you have to mm. you have to understand that. You know, throughout. Uh, in terms of the War of eighteen twelve, that had an incredible impact on Cal, much much greater impact on Calhoun than Adams on his thinking. It was it was really a chastening experience for Calhoun. You know, beforehand, you know, like he made various speeches. You know. You know Stating how you know U.S. forces are just going to just whip through British armies, no problem. And of course, it was just it was, you know the war turned out to be just one military blunder after another mm -hmm. on the part on the part of U.S. forces. Uh, the great exception, of course, being Jackson's spectacular victory at New Orleans. So yeah, he came. I I I, I think the Kevin you know felt, felt, felt uh, to a certain extent responsible for that. And he didn't walk away from it, you know, to his credit. And he, so he had to, you know, uh, promoting the protection of infant industries as one. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's have a bank that works, you know, that will provide credit for us, you know, in a situation like this. You know, let's, let's expand the roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. So, that, you know, you know uh, overcome, you know, the logistical problems that we face throughout the war. And yeah, he, uh, one of the reasons he accepts the you know, secretaryship of war is that you know, Monroe first had, you know, at first, uh, you know, you know uh, asked, asked Clay if he wanted it. You know, Clay said, you know, what would I want that for? You know, uh, it's a miserable, mismanaged department. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, give me state or not, you know, or forget it. The state at the time, of course, was stepping stone for the presidency. But yeah, this is uh, yeah, it's uh, very very important Calhoun's development. 
I said, you know, and where's Calhoun? Yeah, he, he didn't walk. You know, I too often, you know, people who take these posi take positions. I think we just there. He was, you know, what went wrong here? And he really, he really did try to uh, to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Well, not to mention uh, improving the 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 army. In the training of oh yes yes uh, yeah, yeah yeah he mm -hmm. I mean, uh, miserable you know the, the department was in, in, in miserable condition when he took over he he really he really he, you know he really did try funding uh, uh, improved education at West Point you know improve the conditions of of you know of common soldiers mm -hmm. yeah he. he uh, Evans afterwards, you know, felt the you know, way to you know been run around by the generals, but most historians, you know, give give, give Calhoun pretty high marks for his conduct of, of the Department of War during his years there. Well, he almost balanced the budget. Yes, you know, he, he yeah, yeah. Seriously, <laughs> yeah. How often does that happen? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, well, I don't know. That is also, it's just, it's just it's a little less arrogant. You know, and a little less, uh, the War of 1812 injects his prudential strain in his character, certainly when it came to foreign affairs. He, you know, uh, afterwards, you know, various, various, various things, turning Spain, England, the Mexican War, just said, this isn't going to be as easy as it looks. And, uh, or you know there might be problems here. He's very, very concerned. Mm. And again, again, part of his experience, something that he never forgot. Mm. Yeah, so very chastening. Yeah. Um, I had a, a a question that's kind of um, well, it's not really a question, more of an observation. Um. <clears throat> I didn't realize that there were so many different unionisms at play in the 18, the period 18, 10, 20, 30, uh, two factions, uh, two unionist factions in South Carolina, um, the idea of disunion um, before the nullification crisis actually happens. You have these two camps of unionists battling it out oh in south carolina i yeah i yeah. i geez i don't remember i don't remember off hand what what you're referring to oh well the you have one group in 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 charleston uh who are as nullification is becoming more more prominent uh you have the you have the the nullification union group oh yeah, uh, uh, and, yeah. Then you, and then you have the other union group uh, and the governor, I think, is uh, against the nullifiers. No, uh, not, the, not, not the governor, but a number, a number, many prominent Charlestonians, people like the you know, uh, the lawyer James L. Petty Group. That's it. That's it. That's the name. Yep. Sorry, that was the yeah, yeah. Uh, a number of prominent Char Charlestonians were vote. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I just uh, the question about you know the federal government and slavery. There were there were many slaveholders who believed that you know, that you know the future slavery depended on government support, the support of the federal government. Mary Boykin Chestnut's father was reputedly the largest slaveholder in South Carolina for the period. You know, believe it said it any number of occasions. You know, we, you know, we couldn't exist for a day without the federal government. Obviously, no fires, you know, didn't believe that for a second. And so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, unionist, uh, you know, people who thought like, you know, Petty Drew, you know, John Chestnut, just you know, were horrified by, uh, you know, nullification. That, that was this notion that. 
South Carolina or any state would just nullify, you know, of its own accord, you know, nullify a federal law. So it, it, it's sort of an interesting the, clash okay. there of nationalisms, right? Of like yeah, the, that's, yeah. <laughs> like the, yeah. the union focused nationalism versus sort of the South Carolina focused nationalism yes. or the yeah. states focused nationalism. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then what the definition, def the definition of union was, because you have some unionists who would a couple of decades later be considered disunionists. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was very, <laughs> it was, it, it was very hard to get to wrap my mind around um, that that idea that there were multiple versions of unionism, mm -hmm. and it didn't mean the same to everyone. It didn't mean the same yeah. thing. To uh -huh. A curious situation. Oh. How about we do the last question or something? Oh, okay, fine. You, you go ahead, Niels. I, I was actually going to offer it to you, uh, since you, you sometimes like to have the last word, even though it sometimes bites me in the back because then you have like the like ten parter. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, the, we talked about this kind of before we uh, began recording, but um, who is the audience for this for this book? Um, who who are you writing for? Ah. Uh, it's a fairly broad audience. I, you know, I, I, you know, I was hoping that you know my fellow historians would find something interesting in it. So I thought it would work very well. And you know, and, uh, of course, it's on the Civil War, and you know, I think it's accessible to the general reader. I, I tried, at least tried to make it so. But uh, I had a, 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 a simple idea. Probably student, you know, students and in, in, uh on you know, upper level undergraduate courses, yeah, on the Civil War would probably be my you know, kind of ideal audience. Because I can give them something to think about. You know, I, I, I think it's a book that would work well in the classroom. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, definitely. I can see it really be useful in a classroom, like like uh, as a book that covers sort of the war of 1812 to the american civil war right you you, you cover yeah. like in a personalized way this entire period was... yeah yeah i think it's a book that once students started reading that they continued reading it you know they wouldn't throw it back at you and yeah. uh, i was hoping it was anyways <laughs> well, <laughs> well and then uh, not even that it doesn't have to be read in uh in one go either uh, the, the thematic approach is mm -hmm really nice because yeah. you, you you delineate the the um, the ideas so well mm -hmm. that you can really um if it were say for, for a semester i mean you could read you know one chapter and have any number of of of, of class sessions mm -hmm. you know talking about yeah. yeah i i yeah i believe that's the case yes yeah that uh <clears throat> You do more or less, you know, each you know, each of the four main chapters more or less stand on their own. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant to say in so many yeah. words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm going to do the last question. Um, so what was the biggest surprise that you found when you were researching and writing the book? What, what, what surprised you the most? Oh, gee. There, I, I don't think there are any big surprises. You know, there, there, there are a number, number of smaller surprises. Uh, oh, I'm, I, I'm having a hard time with that one. Yeah, yeah getting focused on that one. Great question, though. <laughs> so, because you're always surprised, you know, by something somewhere along the line. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I have a, a question that I could maybe ask. Go ahead. <laughs> Last one. Okay, so obviously this is a dual uh, intellectual biography. I'm talking about Calhoun and Adams. Who else stands out? What's that? Intellectual political biography. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, besides Calhoun and Adams, who would you consider to be um, the the next main character in this in this story 
Oh, as a, uh, I guess you're really my favorite chapter was slavery and anti-slavery. So the next main character would be the anti-slavery movement. Hmm. Hmm. A, a, a kind of collective character, yes. Yeah. The, okay. Well, glad it's not Adam uh, Jackson or, or Clay. No, no. <laughs> All right. Go, go ahead. No. Yeah, that's really uh, one of the things. That, yeah, of course, it's always interested me. What, what difference did abolitionism make? Mm. And this this was this was one of you know a good reason looking at the gag rule controversy. They 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 came out of, and as as Wendell Phillips, you know, leading Garrisonian orator, said afterwards, you know, what did we accomplish here? Well. We, uh, you know, we awaken the country, you know, the dangerous slavery to everyone, not only, not only slaves, but white Americans as well. And, you know, and we brought the South to madness on the question of slavery. So that's, you know, and, and that's really, that's the great contribution of the abolition movement during these years. Hmm. And the gay war controversy was central to that, that, uh, to what they, what they achieved. It's kind of, so then you get back to you know 1830. Nobody wanted to talk about slavery. Yeah. You know, 10, 20 years later, you know, people wouldn't talk about anything else. Mm. And the abolitionist movement was responsible for that. And you know, looking at the gag rule controversy was one way of getting at that. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's why, yeah, that's what the abolitionist movement is my third main character. Yeah. You know. Well, that would be a that would be an interesting triple biography, Zan. Yeah, <laughs> that would be a hard book to write. So, <laughs> yeah, it really would. <laughs> well, it, it was interesting how you you did formulate that chapter uh, with that specific character in mind. Yes. Yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah I, it was. I was really getting that. This, when I first entered graduate school, what I, what I what I wanted to study was you know slavery, abolition, or the coming of the Civil War. I got diverted to labor history and turned out a few books, you know, and there. And I, so I'm kind of coming back home slowly, gradually. Once you know, earlier book on Massachusetts history, and then this one here. There you go. Well, that that works. Sort of yeah. coming back to your roots and old yeah. old desires and hopes. Yeah. Um, well, but gentlemen, it was a great conversation this afternoon, this evening. Um, I hope our listeners get something out of it. And Bill, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and especially on a Sunday that your family allowed you to step away from. Yeah, Emily I'm time. After watching the Patriots, yeah, I. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. There you go. I hope the Patriots do good, Zen. And they're if you're <laughs> well, there's still there's still time. <laughs> um, if you're interested in Bill's book, it is Adams and Calhoun from Shared Vision to Irreconcilable Conflict with the University of South Carolina Press. Um and uh, there was the book in the screen, too. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.